Thank you for joining us. We're just going to give about 15 more seconds for folks to sign on. Greetings and thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Jeff Bowen and I am the Director for Library Programming and Public Affairs. Uh, the library prides itself in bringing uh, people to the, together and building community. Uh, events like the one today are open to a general audience and we're so delighted to inspire learning uh, no matter what your affiliation is to Pepperdine. Uh, following today's lecture, there will be a Q&A session. So throughout the event, feel free to share your questions in the chat box, and we'll address them later in the program. I am so pleased to welcome today's speaker. Uh, John Struloff is the City of Malibu's third po Poet Laureate. He is the author of The Man I Was Supposed to Be, and the recently, recently released The Work of a Genius. He has published poems in The Atlantic, The Southern Review, The Sun, Prairie Schooner, and PN Review. A former Stegner and NEA fellow, he now directs the creative writing program at Pepperdine University. And so I'm so pleased to welcome John Struloff to the Zoom podium. John, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Jeff. And uh, thank you to Pepperdine uh, University uh, Payson Library uh, for arranging this event. And hello to all of you out there. Um, and thank you for joining me. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be reading some from uh, my latest uh, book of poems, which uh, is basically a verse biography of Albert Einstein. Um, and, uh, so I'll be reading some poems from that, but, but first I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, why I started writing a, a book of poems about Albert Einstein. Um, so we have to go clear back uh, to first grade when I, when I started school. Um, it was shortly after I began first grade uh, that my teacher one day uh, came up to me and said, John, uh, we're gonna go uh, to a different classroom. Um, and she walked me over to second grade and, <laughs> and it was during math time and she uh, slid a, a chair over and, and so I joined second grade in math uh, while I was in first grade. I had been in school for maybe a week or two um, and, uh, and I had found, you know, in first grade math, uh, addition and subtraction, uh, just extremely simple and boring. And then I got into second grade and we were doing multiplication and division, and I found it extremely boring and simple. Um, and what I didn't know at that time, uh, was that after that, uh, the, uh, teachers and the principal, um, came to my mother and asked her if they could move me on to third grade uh, math, uh, you know, because I was, I was learning this uh, very quickly. Um, and what I didn't know, I didn't know that any of this was happening. And, uh, and she said no, that she wanted me to stay back with the, the kids who are my age. And so I, I didn't advance after that. Um, but it, it began this time of uh, the teachers and the principal and other students who had heard, you know, they knew what was going on. Um, that they started to um, talk about me um, in turn. Well, they used to call me Einstein. Okay, that was my nickname. Uh, family members. Oh, there's there, there's there's the little Einstein um, uh, because I was very quick at math and I really enjoyed it. Right. And, uh, and they said, oh, he's gonna grow up and become a famous scientist. That's what John's gonna do. And I heard that and you internalize it when you're a child. Um, and that became my vision for what I was gonna do with my life. Um, and I really uh, continued on that path. Um, so when I got into junior high school and we were allowed to then choose our classes, right? Then I started taking algebra and trigonometry and um, you know, pre-calculus and then physics classes. And, and I was, and I started to pursue that. Um, and then, uh, and then right before I graduated high school, 
um, I applied for a physics scholarship and I received a physics scholarship. So when I started college, I was a physics major um, and I was um, following this life of, of being a scientist and being Einstein and, uh, you know, uh, I, I didn't exactly know that what that would entail, but that was the path that I was on. Um, and, uh, and I was very interested in physics and the theoretical aspects of physics. I just enjoyed being in that uh, kind of mental world, thinking about all those things. Um, and it wasn't until my junior year, late in my junior year at college, when I was feeling very stressed and I was getting a much clearer idea of what I would be doing um, as a physicist. Um, and I, that was starting to bother me, at least my vision of what it would look like. Um, I was starting to be uncertain about if I wanted to commit the rest of my life to that. And I started to feel very stressed. Um, and I started to write short stories um, on my own as a stress release in the middle of the night, you know, when I couldn't sleep. Um, and I wasn't really talking to people about it. I was just doing it, right? And I'd, I'd always loved to read. And I came up, I grew up in a storytelling environment, right? So it was just this natural thing that I was doing. And, and I escaped mentally in these worlds. I, I forgot about my stress and I forgot about what was going on. I was mentally immersed in these story worlds that I was writing uh, within. Um, and then one day I just had the thought that oh, I need to be a writer. Like it finally clicked. I'd never thought of that as an option for myself. Uh, so I changed majors and pursued writing from then on, went on to graduate school, got a master's and PhD, wrote books. Um, and here we are now where I'm the director of creative writing at, at Seaver College. Um, but I had that, um, that physics background and that interest in Einstein uh, literally as far back as I can remember. Like I don't remember a time before that, right? Um, and when I got into graduate school, um, I, I decided to, to uh, not just write from my own personal experience, but to do research, um, to look beyond myself and to have, have things where I needed to study the history and context and to just explore much larger um, terrains within my work. Um, and so history then started to become a very important part of a lot of my writing. Um, and, it, and it took until uh, much more recently, about seven or eight years ago, when those two um, collided and, and, and I had the idea, oh, I, I could write about Einstein. I just never thought of that as a project, really. Um, and so I began to do research and, and started to think of, okay, what is it that I could write about? And my original uh, vision uh, was to write a novel you know, a very large novel, uh, looking at the life of Einstein. Um, and, and as a part of my, I guess, development brainstorming work during that time, I started to write poems um, on the side uh, where I was trying to um, like isolate key moments in the life of Einstein and trying to, um, you know, acquire vivid images and, and that sort of thing, trying to figure out uh, trying to locate material. So that's why I started writing poems about Einstein. Um, and then after a while, I started to notice I had a lot of poems about Einstein. <laughs> and it started to make, a, it, it started to seem like a book to me. And then once I had that thought, then, okay, all right, that's interesting. And then I started to work directly towards that, trying to fill out, okay, what what is this? Um, you know, what is this larger uh, vision of his life that I'm trying to explore. Um, and, and that was in 2019 when that happened, early 2019 when I had that thought of, oh, okay, I think I have a book of poems I'm developing. Um, and then I, uh, that year, uh, I finished my draft and then, um, and then it was uh, shortly after the pandemic began uh, that I started to really send it out and try to really uh, publish it, right? I had it in that form finally. So uh, kind of mid mid uh, 2020 last year, okay? All right, so that, that's how I uh, came about writing about Einstein, in case you have that question. Why, why is he writing this book of poems about Einstein? 
Um, you know, th that's part of it, right? Okay. So what I'm gonna do is uh, read some of the poems uh, from the collection and they span a large part of his life, okay? So this first poem is the title poem, uh, The Work of a Genius, and it's set uh, in high school going into college time in Einstein's life. The Work of a Genius. One of Einstein's clearest memories of high school in Germany was of a teacher turning to him. You sit there in the back row and smile, and your mere presence here spoils the respect of the class for me. Upon graduating, he renounced his German citizenship and moved to Switzerland, where he continued this role of brilliant rebel. At the Technical Institute in Zurich, he skipped most classes, used his classmate Marcel Grossman's study notes. He rarely opened his notebook in the few classes he attended and frustrated his professors. He failed physical experiments for beginners. The professors were perplexed because his answers were often correct, but the methods he used to derive them were not the methods they taught. Why hadn't he read the textbooks they had assigned? Instead, he had somehow become obsessed with Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism. He would debate for hours, smoking with his friend Grossman at a cafe looking out to where the Lamont River split around a rocky peninsula. It flowed through the heart of the city and surged in two separate streams toward Lake Zurich the White Alps beyond. This unsettling energy coursed in him every day. He played violin with a blinding focus. Following the stream of notes along a journey, he sensed would lead him to an answer. The stream also flowed through letters he wrote to young women in Aura and Paradise. He smoked, journaling his beloved theoretical physics. It was all the journey. It was all leading toward an answer, a mystery somewhere beyond. One night, when he was supposed to be studying for a math test, he was smoking and looking out his apartment window at a yellow street light, the gray rain descending around it. A piano began to play Mozart's Sonata in C, a rapid rise and fall of notes, a technical wonder. He grabbed his violin and rushed into the night, wishing to join this wonder with his own. He found the house, rain dripping from his hair and slipping down his cheeks. He pushed the door open, startling an old woman. She stopped playing, her eyes wide with fear. He entered carefully, as if entering an animal's den. Please, he said gently raising his violin and offering, go on. The old woman paused thoughtfully, then pressed into the keys and began again. They played with focus, nodding at each other occasionally in mutual admiration, fellow sojourners on this strange voyage of life. He departed with a bow and turned to his dark room where he continued to avoid his mathematics his mind glowing now with musical theories of physics. That weekend after a dismal math test, his parents arrived for a visit. His father looked ill. They both carried a terrible weight. His father's electrical light business had failed once again. Their finances were desperate and his father felt there was something wrong with his health. Albert sat looking at his papers then his smoking pipe with its half scorched contents. He hadn't realized until that moment the depths of their sacrifice for him. They had supported him, given him money at every critical point. He had not taken much, but for them, it was clearly too much. Here he was, their adult child, unable to offer anything in return when they needed it. 
They talked quietly about nothing for another hour, just to feel each other's presence, then departed. What am I doing? He asked, sick with guilt. The next week he entered the laboratory, determined to test himself more critically than his professor. He saw the instructions, crumpled them up, discarded them. The other students were already at work, boiling the alcohol mixture and preparing to monitor its rate of condensation. He lit the flame, envisioning the various theories of gases he'd been studying on his own, poured the alcohol, adjusted the glass beakers. It took eight minutes for the first glass container to explode. The bright lights startled him. Other students shouted. When he reached for a wet cloth, he saw the vivid smear of blood on his right hand. Then it burned, his finger, his palm, his writing hand. Another beaker exploded. In the smoke haze, students threw white powder, a cloud billowing around the apparatus. His professor said nothing, not looking at Albert, as he quickly ensured the danger was contained. Albert's blood streamed onto the floor. Everyone looked at it in horror. His pride told him to stay, but his logical mind knew that the wound must be sewn shut. He wrapped a clean cloth around his hand and hurried to the clinic. For the rest of the day, his body shook. As they sewed his split skin together with black thread, as they wrapped a bandage round and round until it was thick as a boxer's glove, as he sat alone at a cafe trying to figure out how he would hold a fork, let alone a pencil. That night brought despair. It seemed so clear that his life's river had brought him to the wrong destination. He had developed not only into a useless man, but a menace. He had strung these young women along, pretending they were sharing mutual love. He had taken essential money from his parents. He had nearly destroyed the lab at his university. He'd even frightened that old woman out of his irrational need to play music. He looked at his violin in its stand. It would be weeks, if ever, before he could play it again. For the first time, he thought of cutting more of the veins in his arms and ending his life. For hours into the silence of night, his thoughts spun around the vision of cutting a vein and ending his life stream. He woke to the bright morning without realizing he'd lost consciousness. He was surrounded with his papers and books and disheveled stacks. They all looked nonsensical, a vision of incompetence. He found a slice of bread and thin wedge of cheese in his school bag and ate them as an animal would, then spent the morning composing a letter using both his left hand and his painfully bound right hand to move the pencil. The letter was to the mother of Marie. The poor girl had been doing his laundry via the mail service for months, believing they would get married one day sending love letters with his bundles of clothes. It all seemed tragic, another sign of his wasted existence. Painfully, he scrawled, I am writing to you so soon in order to cut short an inner struggle whose outcome is already firmly settled in my mind. It fills me with a peculiar satisfaction that not now I myself must taste some of the pain that I brought upon the dear girl through my thoughtlessness and ignorance. Strenuous intellectual work and looking at God's nature are the fortifying yet relentlessly strict angels that must lead me through life's troubles. He set the letter aside and carefully sorted his books until he found the math textbook he'd so mockingly rejected, hoping it wasn't too late to change a deep river's course. This next poem is a short poem, and it is uh, what I would imagine is a natural outcome of what I just described. 
Okay. It's called, we cannot recommend you. The problem is, his professor said, that you skipped most of my classes. You refused to listen to me or any of your other professors. You are witty. You've shown us ceaselessly, sometimes even brilliant. But you mock what we do. How could we possibly recommend you for any sort of position of responsibility? The outcome of this was becoming clear. I will be the only graduate not to be offered a teaching position, Albert said. His voice shook. That famous quick mind was clouded by his mother's voice. Her warnings that he had been setting himself up for a failure, that he was, at heart, a lazy child of a man. His professor closed his file and leaned back. Perhaps you were meant for something else. And, uh, and so that, that happened when he completed his PhD program. And he uh, did not get letters of recommendation and therefore he did not get a teaching position. Um, and he was in a very terrible situation. And he's uh, distraught and frustrated, didn't know what to do with his life, like what he was going to be doing. And uh, a, a friend of his in graduate school um, arranged a connection with the patent office in Bern, Switzerland, the capital of Switzerland. And so he got hired as a patent clerk. And it was during that time uh, when he felt lost um, and was working a job he didn't want to be working that he wrote uh, his most famous papers. Um, uh, the first relativity paper and then uh, the paper that gives us the famous equation E equals MC squared. And then the uh, paper on the photoelectric effect that ended up getting the, him the Nobel Prize. Uh, that was done while he was working at the patent office and out of an academic environment. Um, and so it's kind of amazing how it all worked out, but he didn't know it at the time. And he was living a very frustrating existence at that time. Okay. All right. So fast forward a few decades and, um, and now we're in California. So he's arriving in California at this point. Um, and so this poem is called City Lights. When Albert arrived in San Diego by steamer in December 1930, he was, of course, greeted by hundreds of girls in uniform at the pier. They sang a song he vaguely recognized. Then the US Navy marching band played Oh Holy Night because it was New Year's Eve. When the mayor drove him to Balboa Park, Onlookers stood along the road waving white kerchiefs as if surrendering to his intelligence. He was ensnared in hours of speeches and greetings before being driven through Los Angeles to Pasadena, which was his destination. He was to spend the winter of 1931 here, talking with many of the greatest physicists in the United States. After a day of rest, he was driven up a long and winding road into the mountains. At the top, surrounded by a snowy pine forest, was the enormous white dome of the Mount Wilson Observatory. The flat plain of Los Angeles stretched far to the distant ocean, the sun an orange ball of fire on the horizon. The gaunt Edwin Hubble came out to greet him, then led him inside where the massive telescope was positioned at an angle within a lattice frame of metal. Hubble had used this telescope to make his latest discovery that the farthest galaxies traveled faster away from us than the nearest. This proved yet another conclusion of relativity, one that Albert had doubted. When it grew dark, Hubble adjusted the telescope so he could view one of the most distant galaxies ever seen. He stood near Albert's shoulder smoking a pipe quietly describing several other galaxies just out of sight of the view, viewfinder. They talked as they returned to the car. Here, the city lights were illuminated. A galaxy of stars spread across the Los Angeles plain. 
The next day, he was brought to Hollywood to view the film sets. At lunch, Charlie Chaplin was called in and they ate together. A natural friendship formed as if their spirits had known each other for years. Chaplin was amused by Albert, his eyes alighting whenever he tried to explain anything about light or energy. They also both cared deeply about the growing turmoil in Europe. And as Albert told him about some of the fears after the war, Chaplin lowered his eyes and listened somber, somberly. When it was time to depart, Chaplin gripped his hand in both of his and insisted that Albert come to the premiere of his latest film, City Lights. He laughed as Chaplin convinced him, you must experience this. Albert agreed. On the night of the premiere, he was beside Chaplin on the red carpet in front of the Los Angeles Theater, both in their tuxedos. He wondered at the lights. He'd never seen so many, a million more than what his father had used to first light the Oktoberfest in Munich so many years before, even more than when he had visited Times Square. A crowd cheered up and down the street. He knew it was not just for him this time. There was a certain energy within the sound that was new. He leaned toward Chaplin. What I admire about your art is the universality. You don't say a word in your films, yet the world understands you. Chaplin smiled with his bright teeth. And look at you, he said. The entire world admires you yet not a single person understands what you say. And if you look at the headlines, um, uh, you know, around the time that um, the eclipse was used to prove uh, some of his ideas about, uh, you know, gravity, relativity, um, the, the, it was so common for the headlines to be something like, you know, only seven people in the world understand what Albert Einstein is saying, you know, um, and, and they talked about it as a, in terms of that he was like speaking some other language and, and no one actually knew what he was saying, but it was certainly a great idea, whatever it was. You know? um, the head, that was very common in the headlines of that time period. Okay, so I'm going to move forward to uh, August of 1945. And uh, one of the things that interested me, you know, in terms of what I was trying to write about with Einstein, was this um, aspect of his life where in 1905, when he had that miracle year, he was working at the patent office. Um, and he wrote the paper uh, that has the equation e equals mc squared, which is a correlation between mass and energy, right? So energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, right? Speed of light is very fast, big number. Then you square it, it becomes an even larger number. And so energy equals that large number times a tiny mass, right? So the, the concept being that a very small amount of mass or matter uh, can have enormous uh, stored energy, right? Potential energy in it. Um, and then you go uh, to, um, you know, World War II and people that Einstein knew, um, who knew what was happening in Germany, knew that they were using this concept um, to build, try to build atomic bombs. And they were getting much closer. They were making some key discoveries. They were trying to secure uranium in Africa um, and just a, a number of, of things that were, it was illustrating the fact that, um, that the Nazis might be able to make an atomic bomb. And that would be a, just a horrifying development. And so Einstein, even though he's a lifelong pacifist, it was why he, while he was uh, still high school age, gave up his German citizenship um, on his own decision uh, because of the militarization of the country. It was an aspect of the country that he just couldn't stand. Um, and he was a lifelong pacifist. Even though he was a lifelong pacifist, he also knew um, 
the result of, of the Nazis getting an atomic bomb. Um, and so he uh, wrote a letter to Roosevelt using his influence. He was an extremely world famous uh, scientist at the time. And, uh, and he convinced uh, Roosevelt to uh, develop uh, the Manhattan Project, basically. And that was a trigger for the start of the project. Um, so this lifelong pacifist brings this concept of mass and energy into the world. He then pushes our president uh, to create the first atomic bomb. Um, and, then, uh, and then right before the war ended, uh, he actually wrote a follow-up letter saying, uh, basically, don't, don't do it. Don't unleash this on humanity. Um, and, and that arc, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about him as a person, what it would be like to be that individual uh, who, who lives through that, who brings that concept into the world and then lives with those consequences, right? And so th this poem is a shorter poem. It's August 6th, 1945. The sun was starting, startlingly, startlingly <laughs> uh, bright off Saranac Lake when he awoke. His bedroom was on the second floor of the cottage, which stood on a hill in a stand of white pine above the Knollwood boathouse. The sun was a blinding, shimmering circle midway to the far shore and its dark forest. He descended the creaking stairs to the kitchen where his secretary, Helen Dukas, had begun setting out breakfast upon hearing his steps. The sun had left a deep blue blind spot in his vision. He rubbed his eyes and sat, pouring hot water into his teacup. Helen was unusually silent as she sliced the bread and collected the jam and fruit for their meal. In fact, the entire lake was silent, which was odd during these late summer, late weeks of summer. I thought I heard the radio when I awoke, he, he said. She placed the food on the table and handed him a heavy butter knife. You did, he asked, is there something the matter? She looked up for the first time. The Americans have dropped a bomb on a city in Japan. It destroyed it instantly, they say. A hundred thousand people. He stood and walked out onto the veranda. No one was in sight, not a single boat on the water. He listened. The sun glared over the entire lake and the forest beyond. My God, he said. This last poem is the uh, last poem in the book. It's called The Final Hour. He had known about the aneurysm for years, but the sudden pain in his chest was terrifying. He ran to the bathroom and leaned against the sink, looking at the dark agony in his own eyes. His uncomprehending mind asked, is this what death looks like. He slipped into delirium. Doctors arrived, everyone gathering around his bed. It had the heat, the feel, as it was so many occasions in his life in recent years, like a government council convening about the fate of the homeland. The threat was imminent and overwhelming. Would they surrender with dignity or fight and desecrate the entire body? He decided there would be no surgery. It was time. The chill of this decision settled in deep. Will it be a horrible death, he asked. It would be painful, but not for long. He would feel the rupture, the torn nerves sharp with agony, then drift into unconsciousness, much as he had in his bathroom earlier. They watched him, suspecting a change of mind. But now there was no pain, and all this attention was comforting. It became clear the worst death would be 
to die alone without anyone to reach out to when the final agony began. No, he said, I have done my share. It is time. I will do it elegantly. The doctors laughed. At dawn, he awoke alone. Ice and fire spread slowly out from his heart. It paralyzed him. He gagged, unable to call out. Hearing noises, his secretary entered her eyes wide. The only thing he wanted was to hold her hand. He reached for her, and once he grasped her hand, he wouldn't let go. This touch was an ecstasy of relief beneath the looming ex existential terror. An ambulance came, the icy surge of morphine. Once in his hospital bed, the pain began to ease. He sat up. The morning sun gave him a little energy. Everything was so white and bright. How could he not feel awake? He asked for his notepad and a pencil. There were two enormous tasks yet to complete. He was to give a commemoration speech for the newly formed state of Israel. And then his final scientific goal, even greater than relativity, the grand unified field theory, which would unify all of physics. He wrote on each all that day, taking breaks to close his eyes and feel the world around him, the coarse fabric of his hospital blanket, the chemical aroma of ethyl alcohol. Then his son Hans appeared somehow from his home in California. He gripped his hand, which seemed to trigger a special light in his son's eyes. They talked. When eventually there came a period of silence, he looked at his newly written papers. My math isn't enough, he said. The thought settled into his body. He had long known that with each year that passed, an old man spent more time facing the deaths of old friends until only his own death remained. He just hadn't suspected that last friend would be mathematics. He closed his eyes again. Then everyone was gone. It was night. He grew tired. Just after one in the morning, he woke with a start. The pain was blinding. He called out into the dark. What was it he said? His nurse, who hurried to his room, would have asked if only she knew how to speak the language of the dead. All right, thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we have uh, time for questions, yeah. Great, thank you, John, for uh, sharing these, these wonderful poems. Um, and yes, at this point, uh, uh, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat box and I will uh, read them to, to John. Um, uh, it looks like we have uh, uh, first one pop up. Uh, what was something surprising um, that you learned about Einstein during your research? Okay, yeah, um, there are a number of things that, that I found very interesting that I didn't know. Um, and so one thing was, and I talked a little bit about this just a, a little bit ago, um, was how challenging his professional life was, you know, um, like uh, my vision a long time ago of Einstein was that everything is easy, you know, he's called a genius, right? A life of a genius is easy. You know, they, they know everything, they're quick at everything. Um, and uh, it all just fell into his lap, you know, um, because he was a genius. Uh, but then when I looked at his uh, struggles and the difficult decisions that he made, and how he uh, undermined himself during his graduate program and made it, you know, so that they wouldn't write letters of recommendation and then he didn't know what he was going to do next. And, you know, he was off of the path that he had envisioned for himself um, and how that was a real struggle. Um, and, and so that was surprising, just the extent of, of, 
uh, those difficult years in his life. And it took him, uh, you know, um, a good decade until about 1914 before. Um, so 1905 was that miracle year, but he'd been working in the patent office for some time by then. Um, and it wasn't until 1914 that he really had the, uh, uh, the offer uh, to return to Berlin, which you know, he was uncertain about because of you know, his history with Germany. Um, but that was that moment of kind of like, uh, things began to really come, come back together and coalesce in his life. Um, but, but that struggle, uh, you know, especially during uh, those uh, directly after his PhD program, uh, that was really interesting and unexpected. I just didn't know that about his life. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the intersection of historical fact and where you, as a creative writer, uh, take some artistic liberty in trying to uh, imagine, you know, the thoughts at the time? Uh, to me, these poems, you know, read uh, like personal journal entries, and it's amazing how, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you know, it's kind of exposing the mind of, of a genius. So I'm really curious about that. that yeah. Uh, parallel. Yeah, and that, that's certainly something that I've thought about quite a bit, going clear back into my PhD program when I was um, doing the, my first history-based writing, and I was trying to figure out, you know, uh, how to navigate that issue that you're talking about. You know, how do, how do you dramatize and call something fiction, but it's, it's based on fact? And then, you know, how do you navigate that? And, um, and one of the things I learned is that there's a real spectrum um, in terms of how people navigate that line, you know? Um, it, there are some people who just don't do any research. They just go on the, the knowledge that they happen to have about a historical era, even if it's wrong. And they just go with that. They don't research it. And then they just make up a story and try to make it sound like it's in a certain historical period, you know, um, based on really no research. That some people take that approach. Um, I, I know some writers uh, who are successful and they do it well, um, who they spend a year or multiple years researching, uh, you know, a person or a historical period um, of just an enormous amount of research, collecting details and internalizing, like memorizing the, the time period and, and all of these things that are, that are fact, you know, that are recorded history. And, but then once they begin to write, they set all of that aside and they go just by what they've internalized. And so they're not referring back to documents and double checking things, you know, they've done the research and then when they move forward, um, they're just going by their memory of it. And, you know, they've, they've uh, internalized so many good details that, that they're able to pull it off well, right? Um, and my approach is, you know, a bit further along than that is I do a lot of research beforehand, but then as I'm writing, I'm double checking things and, and continuing to do a lot of follow-up research. Um, and, and trying to read multiple sources. And as much as possible, I want people to be able to depend on what I'm writing about, um, you know, uh, based on, like, I don't want someone to be able to go to a source, to go to a document or, a, you know, a biography, and then point out how I'm clearly wrong about something, you know? Like, uh, I, I, I want it to be dependable in terms of the recorded information, but I'm also thinking about, you know, Einstein or the people involved, and I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to think about the, the real human story that I'm hearing in it and seeing in it, and then I try to uh, depict that, I try to bring that to life. But it's, you know, it's very much connected with uh, the historical record. That's an important thing for me. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Yeah. Uh, another question in the chat box has just come in. People say that physics and poetry have some kind of symbiosis. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, and uh, this uh, person also just added a, a part B 
The relationship between math and poetry is another mystery to me. How has math been influential to you? So it's a, a two-part question. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, you know, I guess you could see math and poetry and music, you know. I, I'm also interested in music, and Einstein was as well. Like he, you know, he wasn't a professional violin player, but he, that was a very important part of his life. In fact, when a, a lot of times, um, you know, as part of his process, if he was trying to work through something difficult and, and it wasn't quite coalescing in his mind, you know, he was getting close and he knew he was on the track, he would uh, start to play his violin and it would put him into this, um, you know, it kind of get in, into this thoughtful, uh, meditative mental space while he was playing his violin. Um, and he was a pretty talented violin player. Um, and, and that was a helpful uh, thing for him to go into that meditative space. Um, you know, some of the things that, that, you know, there's a lot that's been written about math and music, right? Um, the, within music, there are all these uh, repetitive structures and, and you know, um, uh, structures that build on structures and have these certain systematic patterns like you would see in nature, you know, like in, in terms of uh, uh, you know, physics equations, that, you know, that, that you can define experiences from. Um, and uh, and the, the cadence in music, right, and repetition and, uh, and, and clear beats right, that are systematic, and they have an equal length between them, right, and very clear structures. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of similarities uh, between those. Uh, um, and, you know, one of the aspects of physics that really interested me when I was, you know, still on that path is that, at, you know, at first you're really studying um, yeah, fairly straightforward mathematics. Um, but I think um, w when you start dealing with like relativity and more complex mathematics, uh, which Einstein was in all the time mentally, he was in that space, then it, it does bring up these very large questions, like philosophical questions about the nature of time, uh, the nature of perception, um, and, and nature itself, you know? Like what are the what are the laws that define nature, um, and uh, and it, and so the the physics and math becomes something that that is m more in like a philosophical terrain in a lot of ways. And Einstein uh, read philosophy, and and had a lot of conversations with people in different fields, um, and uh, and you know, specifically about these philosophical concepts. Uh, and so for him, it was all blurred. Um, and, uh, and so art and philosophy and the mathematics for him was all, all one space. And, and for me, I enjoyed, you know, I enjoyed the puzzle of the mathematics, right? But I also enjoyed those larger questions, you know, about, um, where did the universe begin? You know, what, what is time? Uh, and, uh, you know, and the, the theory of relativity is just such a natural metaphor. I mean, for shifting from like a monolithic perspective of what people are to recognizing uh, that, that people have their own individual perspectives. I mean, all of us do. And we're living within our own, uh, you know, vantage point our entire lives. And so relativity uh, just formally recognizes that. And as a writer, uh, you're writing from, you're not speaking from a monolithic perspective, you're writing from your own uh, point of reference in, in the world, right? Um, so uh, I, I hope that answers it in some way in terms of overlap and correlation between all these things. I, I think it's really interesting to kind of consider um, those connections and how, you know, science and mathematics and, and the arts overlap in those ways. Yeah.
Have you considered writing another book on other famous figures in math and science, maybe like a Stephen Hawking, uh, Descartes, or, or others? Um, yes, I have. Um, I don't know. You know, some authors, they're a bit reticent to talk about projects that they haven't finished yet, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm a little hesitant in some ways to talk about things that I um, but yeah, I certainly have a lot of ideas um, and I'm very interested in that, you know, especially after writing this about Einstein, it started to uh, get me to think about um, this, this long-standing interest of mine in science, um, exploring more aspects of that life. Uh, you know, my dissertation um, was a history-based novel and it was based on uh, family history, uh, which is uh, Russian religious history. So my grandfather was part of a religious sect in Russia that was terrorized by the government and they had to flee the country. Um, and so the, the history was not about science, it was about the religious history and, and you know, about uh, the nature of just freedom and, and, and um, you know, what kind of a society we, do we wanna live in? Uh, what are we going to fight for, you know, in terms not battling, but, you know, uh, politically, what are we going to try to strive for? Um, and then that led me to writing about Leo Tolstoy. Uh, again, not about science, right? Um, but about a number of different developments that were happening in society and changes. Um, and that th he was uh, like at the nexus of, right? And so Einstein was the, the, the one after that, and it opened up this door to science. And, and because I wrote this book, I've read a number of uh, novels, but also uh, poetry collections. There are some, not that many, <laughs> um, that deal with uh, you know, so historical scientific figures and, and trying to put that into poetry and trying to explore that in poetry. Um, so it's kind of a new terrain for me, but it's really interesting. Um, there's so many possibilities. So I do have some plans for uh, books that I'm working on right now. Uh, one thing I, I was wondering as you were reading your poems, um, in City Lights, uh, you talk about uh, the mutual respect and admiration between Einstein and Charlie Chaplin. Um, Chaplin. Uh, did, uh, was there anything um, interesting that didn't make it into the poem during your research that you found out about their relationship? Um, let's see. I don't, not necessarily so much about their relationship, but about Chaplin himself. Like, you know, once I had gone onto that track, I, you know, I, I saw a, a photo of them together in tuxedos and I was like, what's going on with that? And so I had to look into it and explore, you know, and then I found, um, you know, parts of biographies and things that, that talked about that. And so it opened up this door to really thinking about Charlie Chaplin. And he is just this amazing, complex individual. You know, it opens up this whole door into very large aspects of history of that time period uh, that were just fascinating. And I could easily write uh, additional poems on Charlie Chaplin, you know. Um, but I mean, they didn't have a deep uh, relationship really, you know? I mean, they had some interactions, uh, but it wasn't like a, a long standing, extensive uh, part of Einstein's life, you know? And so, but uh, Chaplin's pretty fascinating individual. Yeah. All right. Well, it looks like there are no more questions in the chat box and we're almost out of time. Uh, did you have any, um, uh, other thoughts that maybe we didn't get to that you wanted to, uh, you know, here's your chance to throw them out there. Um, no, I, I don't think so. Um, uh, no, I think we've covered it, so. <laughs> Great, well, well, John, thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to share your writings. Um, it was a, truly an a inspirational event. Um, I love, love learning about uh, Einstein and then hearing, uh, you know, your, your uh, um, uh, 
you know, your, 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 your imaginations going into, you know, what was going on behind these uh, historical events. Um, uh, and uh, I want to thank everyone uh, for attending this event. Um, we have several other events coming up at the library, uh, including one on Earth Day, featuring another Pepperdine faculty member, Professor of Religion Chris Duran will give a lecture titled Purpose, Service, Leadership, and Climate Change. Is Pepperdine equipped to meet the planet's biggest challenge? Uh, this Thursday, April 22nd at 1 p.m. Uh, you can learn more about this and other events at library.pepperdine.edu slash events, or you can just, again, go to the homepage and click on the events uh, icon. Um, so uh, that wraps up uh, today's event. And again, John, thank you for sharing your wisdom and we'll see you all at our next event.